Let's start part two. There we go, part two. And we are talking about self-regulation, you know, in the control model. And uh, the textbook describes a very interesting experiment Baumeister did back in 1998 on self-regulation. Uh, first off, he asked subjects not to eat. Well, well I've got to get my pen going. Not to eat for five or six hours before coming to the lab. You come to the lab, and for all conditions, there's a little oven there baking cookies. And so that smell of yummy cookies is there. And then uh, you're given instructions uh, based on your condition uh, to either eat two or three cookies or eat two or three radishes. And uh, then uh, you're left alone for like five minutes uh, while you're going to eat your co uh, cookies or radishes based on condition. And all the subjects ate what they were ordered to eat. But the researchers were hoping that that's not what they wanted to eat. That is, you leave somebody alone in a room that smells like cookies. They're hungry, really hungry. There's some cookies sitting out and some radishes, you tell them, oh, I want you to eat radishes and radishes only, and then you leave. And they secretly observed everyone, and nobody cheated, which was pretty good. But think about this. So you want to eat cookies, because you smell cookies and you're hungry, and you eat cookies. Uh, yeah, that's you know, no problem. That's not self-regulation. That's just doing what you want. Uh, but let's say that uh, you, uh, you know, are told to eat radishes and you eat a radish and you know, a radish, you know, uh, but then there's these cookies laying out. And so you really have to exert willpower or self-control or self-regulation uh, in this condition here where you're forced to eat the radish or asked to eat the radishes. So we have two conditions. One condition where the subjects have not really used that much self-regulation and the other condition where they used a great deal of self-regulation. Then the next part of the experiment begins and the subjects are asked to work on a difficult task uh, and actually it's a task that with no solution and the whole thing is to see how long people will work on it uh, before they give up and what they found was if you were asked to eat the radishes you gave up after eight minutes on average and if you're asked to eat the cookies and of course you did eat the cookies you gave up after 19 minutes the huge difference between these two groups was based on uh, the fact that this the radish group had used up all of their self-regulation, all of their willpower, and since they used it up, they could only have a little bit to spend on this task. However, the people who were asked to eat the cookies didn't use any of their uh, self-regulation strength, and so they had a lot of that strength to continue on when they were working on this really, really difficult problem. And so that's why you see this huge difference between the two conditions uh, in this experiment. And so we know from this and other studies that self-regulating is tiring. That is, we have a limited resource uh, of strength in order to self-regulate our behavior and once we expend it, it's gone, and we don't have any more for a while. We have to rest and, you know, recharge our ego. And this is known as the ego depletion model of regulation. And, you know, uh, the textbook says, uh, this is straight from the textbook, self-regulation depends upon the availability of willpower, the mental energy needed to change the activities of the self, to meet the desired standards. And, you know, it says this very directly, willpower acts like a muscle. It can be strengthened with practice, and also like a muscle, it can be worn out if you use it too much. 
uh, self-regulatory attempts will limit willpower, in effect deleting it and preventing it from being used for other purposes. Just like a muscle, if you uh, spend the day lifting heavy things all day and then you try to move your couch at night, you don't have the strength to do it. And again, page 189 uh, of your textbook. Check it out. However, and not only have uh, Baumeister and lots of other people said this, and Baumeister uh, <clears throat> is a very famous social psychologist, but, and the textbook said it, but that statement is in doubt. Or at least some people would say it's in doubt. Other people would say that we cannot uh, accurately or confidently give uh, people that advice. And that's um, been a major change in social psychology. Uh, this was back in 1998, uh, during the turn of the century decade, people were talking about this ego depletion model and giving advice to people about don't you know, do things to deplete your uh, you know, self-control or willpower before you have to do something important. Uh, however, uh, what we're going to talk about now is how this big area of research uh, may not be accurate or may not be true at all. And to do that, what I need to introduce to you in a non-technical way is the idea of a meta-analysis. I've already introduced the idea of a meta-analysis uh, in the Psych Info lectures, but now let's talk about non-technically what it, that exactly it is. A meta-analysis is a type of statistical analysis. And in this statistical analysis, using different types of statistics designed specifically for this uh, situation, we systematically examine <coughs> oh, excuse me, the results of several studies. So let's say that you have 100 studies on one topic, 100 studies on self-regulation which after about 10 years we had over 100 studies. Uh, you know, they show different things. Uh, how can you summarize them? Well, one way you can summarize them is by doing a, a meta-analysis which will statistically, not based on anyone's judgment, but based on numbers, statistically summarize the results of all these studies. So not only will it do that, summarize the studies, but it will take advantage of the very large number of subjects that you have from the combined studies. Let's say that one experiment has a hundred students in it, so uh, you know a hundred uh, experiments may have uh, a five thousand, ten thousand subjects in it. Uh, there are some very significant benefits to having such a high N or such a large number of subjects in a statistical analysis. Also, uh, errors that we're aware of, that is systematic errors and also you know, non-systematic errors, just plain old random errors, uh, associated with individual studies tend to get canceled out. Uh, one study may have been done very early uh, in like the 1999, uh, the year of 1999. The other may have been done in 2009. And uh, so uh, the time the study was done is, uh, you know, a systematic uh, error. And those two studies will cancel each other out. The error of when they were done will cancel each other out. Not only that, uh, but uh, Meta-analysis, if done well, can take advantage of the different methodologies or the different populations or the different whatevers used across all these studies. And they will allow you to identify patterns and also make conclusions. For example, in uh, uh, you know, uh, willpower studies, ego depletion studies, uh, how do you deplete the ego? Well, one popular way is following what Baumeister did, which was to give people cookies or radishes. Uh, but there's lots of other ways, other methods to do this, and there's like five or six popular ones. And so what you could do in a meta-analysis is you could identify those five or six different 
uh, you know, uh, manipulations that they create, uh, you know, uh, ego depletion with. And you can, across these hundred studies or so, you can look for patterns. Does one of these, uh, you know, uh, do one of these uh, manipulations work better at creating ego depletion than others? And you can make conclusions about that. So in terms of what a meta-analysis can do, it's a very nice package of what more information they can give us than just one study or just reading a hundred studies and uh, coming up with your own hunch about how they should uh, be described as a whole. And uh, the idea of the meta-analysis has really revolutionized science over the last 20 years uh, and especially medicine. Uh, medicine has gone from being, uh, you know, research-based to evidence-based. And what those terms mean is, you know, 35 years ago, uh, you could get something to become a standard practice in medicine by having one or two research studies that show that this works. And today, in order to get something to be accepted as standardized medicine, you have to probably have a meta-analysis of dozens of studies uh, and taking advantage of the benefits of meta-analysis. And indeed, you often see uh, you know, charts like this that show us the relative merit of the different types of uh, you know, research studies. And so when we're talking about uh, case reports, uh, animal or in vitro studies, cross-sectional studies. These are mainly for medicine. However, uh, you know, these here are the, uh, uh, you know, pseudo, uh, the uh, uh, quasi-experiments. that you'll learn about in research methods. Experiments that are missing one or two important things of a randomized control study. So these quasi-experiments, while they're giving us some data, which is kind of trustworthy, it's not perfect. But in terms of doing one study perfectly, a randomized control study is it. And that's why it's higher than these other studies here. But then, you know, we see that even better than uh, you know a randomized control study an experiment is a meta-analysis so uh, non-technically how does a meta-analysis work and you have to understand non-technically two uh, you know concepts one is the effect size and I guess the other is correlation so let's talk about effect size the effect size is a quantitative measure of the relative magnitude of a phenomenon. That's the technical definition. And what I mean by that is what a phenomena is just the technical term for the relationship between an IV and the DV. That is, uh, what is the size, the relative size, magnitude, of the relationship between the IV and DV? That is, you have a control condition, and then you measure the dependent variable, and then you have an experimental condition, and then you measure the dependent variable. How much do the dependent variables differ from those two conditions? And we've already given you an example of it. Uh, if we go back here, uh, we have this phenomena here. Let me clear this up, clean this up, and let me get my marker back. My marker is ba not back, I'm learning. Now it is back. That is the relationship between the IV and the DV. And so we have two conditions, cookie or radishes. The radishes is really the control condition. This is the experimental condition, the ego depletion condition. And as we see here, the control condition, oh, no wait, I'm sorry, I've just uh, reversed those. This is control and this is experimental. This is the ego depletion condition. So, uh, you know, cookies, the control condition. So when you're not ego depleted, when you're a control subject, 
uh, you work on the puzzle for 19 minutes. However, when you've been treated with the experimental treatment, you work less than half, you know, half the time. Uh, and that, the difference between 8 minutes and 19 minutes, that's really a raw effect size. EFF, I can't write with my mouse. effect size. So that is an example of an effect size. So uh, you know some examples, more technical examples of an effect size, the difference between the means of the control and treatment conditions, I just showed you that, uh, or other ways we could des describe the effect size and have measures of it, the correlation between two variables, or the regression co coefficient between two variables. These are all three different ways that we generate numbers uh, to uh, give us a variable for effect sizes. I said meta-analysis, not meat-analysis. Uh, so let's talk about one of these other uh, you know, measures of effect size, uh, correlational studies and a correlation. And you may recall that uh, one of the more common ways which we measure a correlation, a linear correlation, is Pearson's R. And Pearson's R measures the strength and direction between two variables. And Pearson's R can go from negative one, meaning that there's a perfect negative correlation. As one variable goes up, another variable drops down at the same rate. An R of zero means there's no relationship between the two variables. As one variable uh, you know, goes up, the other does whatever it wants to do, and there's no relationship. To an R of positive one, as one variable goes up, the other variable goes up at the same rate. Uh, and we can also talk about rubrics, about how big uh, you know, these numbers are. And uh, you know, just thinking about the positive end of, the, of uh, you know, Pearson correlation scores, uh, any uh, correlation between 0 and 0.3 we consider a small effect size. That is, there's an effect, but it's not a very big one. Uh, a, a correlation between 0.3 and 0.5 in psychology, we consider that a moderate effect size. And finally, anything above 0.5 is considered a large effect size. And here we have a correlation between people's ratings of themselves uh, based on two uh, descriptors. And this is from uh, the uh, Big Five inventory, uh, the NEOPI. Uh, we have people rating themselves, how imaginative are you, one to five? And also people rating themselves, how broad interest, uh, interested are you? one to five and we see that we have a positive correlation here in that as one variable goes up the other variable goes up and we see this uh, rising here so you know for example uh, this dude here sees themselves as not very an imagine imaginative person and having yeah, narrow-ish interests However, uh, this person up here, she sees herself as very imaginative and having extremely broad interests. And uh, you know, the width of a circle you could draw around the dots, that gives you an indication of the correlation, the R, the strength of it. And this is a very narrow, this is a hot dog, and hot dogs are usually like 0.7 or 0.8. Uh, so this is a strong positive correlation. Okay, now that we understand what correlations are, I can walk you through a case example of a meta-analysis. And this case example is in IO psychology. There's an IO psychologist who works for a manufacturing plant. And they use an employment test to hire people for the plant. And this test correlates 0.25, Pearson's correlation of 0.25, with job performance. Now, 
that tells you two things right off the bat. It's positive, so that means the higher you score on this employment test, the higher your job uh, performance will be when they measure it on the job. And then also it's 0.25, so it's kind of a uh, small effect size. It's there, uh, but you know it's uh, the relationship between the two is not uh, you know that strong, but it is there. Okay, so that's what you've been doing uh, for your job uh, as an IO psychologist for years using this employment test, and it's worked out fairly well. Uh, if you have a large enough uh, sample of workers, you can really save your company a whole lot of money with a test that measures uh, job performance uh, with a correlation of 0.25. But then you hear about this new test people are talking about, and you want to know if you want to switch from your old test to the new test. So what you do is you do a literature review and you find four studies using this new test. And oh, we're talking about here, you're taking an employment test and we're correlating it with your actual performance on the job later on. Uh, and so here's another example of the correlation. We have employment test scores, we have job performance, and we can see here uh, it's a positive relationship in that if you want to draw a line that captures uh, most of the dots, it would be this way, it would be positive. And then also you would not have a hot dog, but you'd have like a lumpy potato or an egg, and that's a 0.25 correlation. So let's say that we're looking for a new, uh, you know, looking at this new test, and hopefully it's going to do better than 0.25. So we find four studies on it, uh, one done by Smith, Jones, another by Jones, Johnson, and Merriweather, and, Weather, and uh, we see uh, the correlations they find between the employment test and job performance. Smith found uh, a correlation of 0.22 which is actually worse than the test I'm using right now. Jones, however, finds a correlation of 0.33, which is a whole lot better than the test I'm using. Johnson finds a correlation of 0.27, uh, which is a little bit better than the test I'm using. And Merriweather finds a correlation of 0.18, which is much worse than the test I'm using. So now, as an IO psychologist, I'm trying to summarize these things here. Uh, if I go by Smith, I would not change. If I go by Merriweather, I would not change. If I go by Jones or Johnson, I would change. So what, what do I do? Well, I could just rank them as better or worse. And then as you can see here, half are better, half are worse. So that doesn't help me much at all. Uh, what I could do is I could calculate an average uh, correlation. And so I take the four studies and I average them together and look what I get. I get the same correlation as the test I'm using now. So should I just give up and keep on using the test I'm using? Uh, but then again, Jones found this really big correlation or larger correlation. Uh, I, my company could save hundreds of thousands of dollars a year uh, by using a more accurate test. Uh, but then again, it could lose hundreds of thousands of dollars a year using a less accurate test. So my job is on the line. I need to make a good recommendation. Well, I could take into account the fact that these uh, different studies have different sample sizes. That is the Merriweather uh, study had only 99 subjects. Look at this Johnson 33. Jones had 300 subjects and Smith had 125. Why does sample size, uh, why is that important? Uh, because smaller samples have larger error than larger samples or larger samples more accurately uh, sample things and so larger samples are more trustworthy smaller samples are less trustworthy. And so I'm saying, could I see a relationship between uh, the correlations 
and the sample sizes in that these are kind of this is the lowest sample size so it's the least trustworthy so this number is the least trustworthy this is the second least trustworthy this is more trustworthy and this is the most trustworthy well can I do anything with that and sure I can because what you can do is you can weight the correlation by the sample size and weighting is very simple you just multiply the sample size by the correlation and so that's what I do right now uh, and here's a table that does it 125 times 0.22 is 27.5, 99, 80, uh, 8.99, 7, uh, point, uh, 82. That gives me a total of, uh, you know, 153. Uh, and then uh, I divide that by uh, 557, which is the total N, and that gives me 2.75. And so you see what I've done by taking the average weighted correlation uh, is that I've weighted this R value, which shows that you know the new test won't do any better. But since I weighted it with the more trustworthy correlations, I see that it is doing better enough to save my company, you know, maybe a uh, you know a hundred thousand dollars. So that is one benefit I can get out of doing a uh, meta-analysis. And so the first conclusion of our meta-analysis is weighting by the size of the study tells us that the new test is better than the old. And whatever type of uh, topic you're working on, ego depletion, uh, helping behavior, weighting the uh, sample size, uh, you know, weighting the uh, effect size, the correlation by the size of the study, will give us a number which is a more accurate view of how well the IV relates to the DV than anything that we could have done before, such as just averaging the correlation or just counting up what was better or what was worse. So this is the first thing that uh, meta-analyses can do. They can weight the effect sizes of different studies based on their sample sizes, uh, giving the effect sizes uh, of studies with larger n and smaller error uh, more weight, and giving this uh, you know, effect sizes of studies with smaller sample sizes and more error less weight. So that is a very powerful and the main tool of a meta-analysis. That's a star. I should be able to draw a star relatively easy with my mouse. There we go. Okay, so that's the most important thing that a meta-analysis does, but it can do some other really neat things too. Uh, what else can they do? Well, we can group the studies based on variables or characteristics. Uh, what variables or characteristics? Well, when you're doing these employment testing studies, uh, there are two different uh, methods that you can use. One is concurrent validity. And with concurrent validity, what you do is the predictor, that is the ability test, uh, the employment test, if given to hired workers. And then you already have the hired workers uh, you know, job, uh, you know, appraisal information, so you can just do the correlation there. The other is predictive validity, uh, which is you give the predictor, that is the job test, the employment test, you give it to all applicants. And then, here's the next part, all app applicants are hired regardless of their score on the test. Now, uh, this method, the concurrent validity method, it gives you bad external validity uh, because the hired workers uh, don't see the test the same way as job seekers. Can you imagine you go in for a job interview and you're given an employment test and you really want this job and you have this test? Are you nervous? Are you taking this seriously? 
boy, you bet. But then think about the other situation, predictive validity, uh, or no, I'm sorry, concurrent validity. Uh, you know, you're working and then one day your boss comes in and says, hey, everybody uh, leave the factory floor. We're going to do something else. And you're like, ooh, this is exciting. And am I getting paid? Oh, sure, don't worry. And, you know, they put, take you into a classroom and they give you, uh, you know, a test and you're asked to, like, read the test and circle answers. And you're no longer working in that stinky factory floor. This is kind of a break and you're getting paid for it. Woohoo! Wow, this is amazing. And so that's why uh, concurrent validity has poorer external validity, because you can't generalize the results to job seekers. How, and that's who you really want to generalize the results to. However, predictive validity studies have great external validity because you're actually including the people you want to generalize the results to in the study that is job seekers. The only problem is that you have to hire all applicants even if they score horribly on this test. Managers hate this and they never want to use this method. So this is the best method here. But managers block IO psychologists from using it all the time. But my point is, these are two different methods. Which uh, is there any relationship between the method used and the results of the study? And so yes, we can find out in our meta-analysis. So Smith's study used concurrent methodology, concurrent validity. Jones and Johnson used predictive. And Merriweather used concurrent. And here's what I've calculated before. Okay, now let's just look at concurrent methodology. And so I take the correlation, I weight it by the uh, number of subjects, and I do that for both studies, and then I find, uh, you know, and that's the uh, uh, total, and then I divide it by the number of subjects, and that gives me an average weighted uh, effect size, and look at that, uh, 0.20, that's not a good effect size. That's less than, that's working poorer than my current test. Uh, however, let's take a look at the better methodology, predictive. And so I take the number of subjects and use it to weight uh, the effect size that is the R value. I find the sum of the weighted scores and I divide that by the total number of subjects and look at this. Using the better methodology we have a, a better more accurate test or numbers that show us that the test is better and more accurate. So in a way you could say the bad, the concurrent methodology studies are holding down uh, the actual studies that we want to think about. So this is another benefit of using a meta-analysis. We can find out which type of studies uh, have the higher correlations or the better effect sizes. And we could do this with anything. For example, I talked earlier about what if we're using the cookie method, the cookie radish method? What if we're using the raisin olive method? What if we're using the, you know, the hand washing method? we can sort out which methodology gives us the strongest or weakest correlation for ego depletion. And then finally, what else can a meta-analysis do? It can expose a major problem with how research is done. Let's talk about something called the file drawer effect. Uh, the file drawer effect describes a situation in which only significant studies get published. That is, you conduct an experimental study, you do the statistics, and the statistics are either significant or not significant. And everybody knows that significant studies uh, get published more often than non-significant studies. And we say that those non-significant studies end up in the file drawer. That is, uh, you know, literally, 
if I did a study and literally I can take you and show you my file drawer of experiments where I didn't get significant results and so I never tried to publish those studies. And the file drawer effect is that there are all of these negative studies that are filed away that uh, you know should be included in a meta-analysis but a meta-analysis analysis but they aren't because they've not been published. And so these non-published studies probably will affect what conclusion I should make about everything, but I don't have access to them because they haven't been published. So again, file drawer effect, only significant studies get published, non-significant uh, non studies don't get published, and they're filed away and people don't see them. Why is that a problem? Let me show you this hypothetical example. This is hypothetical because this never happens in real life and I'll tell you why in a minute. I have some studies that are published, some that are not published. And normally when you do a meta-analysis you're only going to see these that are published. Rarely do you find these non-published studies. And in many cases a lot of meta-analyses are not looking at or trying to find these non-published studies. Uh, sometimes this happens, sometimes you get lucky, uh, and you can. So for example, we have these studies we're all familiar with. Uh, these, for example, uh, what the IO psychologist did was talked around with friends and he found out that somebody at uh, the in the psychology department at the uh, University of York, Pennsylvania uh, did a study and they didn't publish it and wrote to the guy and the guy sent them uh, a copy of the manuscript or a copy of the data. Uh, a marketing research company uh, did a study and uh, they didn't really publish it but uh, a, through a friend of a friend uh, you could uh, ask around and get it. Uh, people at York University in England uh, they uh, did a study and you were able to find out about this. A small consulting company called the Wilson Group did a study and uh, uh, you know through a friend of a friend you've got a copy of the study. But these have not been published. Now you're very lucky to find people who know about these studies and find people who can give you the studies and in reality this rarely happens. But now let's just treat whether it's published or non-published uh, as a type of methodology. And so we see here the study done at York uh, in Pennsylvania, a hundred subjects and they found a correlation of 0.02, boy. Uh, 200, uh, 280 subjects, a correlation of 0.11. Uh, 35 subjects, a correlation of 0.32. 68 subjects, a correlation of 0.09. Uh, so they're finding things across the board uh, with different sample sizes, some with very small sample sizes, which means that there could be a lot of error. When I sum up all of the weighted uh, effect sizes and divide by the total number of subjects, I get 0.19, which is much less than the test I'm using. So uh, given everything here, I would want to not change my test. Uh, and so this leads to conclusion X, X because it's exciting. If we only knew about the non-published uh, studies, we would know that the new test is not so good. But we can't know because the studies are not published, and since they're not published, we're not going to likely be able to do anything like this. That is, dig out these studies or be an investigator or Sherlock Holmes and find these studies and toss them into our analysis. And well, is this a general thing, a general trend? Yes it is, because I'm getting my pen back and I know how to do it now. Uh, notice that these were very small uh, R's or small effect sizes. In general, the smaller the effect size, the more likely it's not significant. And while this was a big effect size compared to the other ones, 
this was a very small n, and so that would make it less likely to be significant. So what's going on here is these non-published studies are all non-significant. That is, they're all working against uh, the conclusion that this new test works, but these bad studies are being hidden. And they're being hidden by this publication bias. But there is or there are two solutions to the file drawer effect. Uh, the first is you can estimate. That is, you can uh, estimate the number of file drawer uh, non-significant negative studies that exist in the world based on assumptions about the statistical characteristics of the published studies. And so what you do is you look at the uh, statistical characteristics blah, of the published studies and then what you do is you apply a couple mathematical models to estimate what you think uh, the uh, effect size should be if you take into account uh, these hypothetical file drawer studies. Uh, and I'll talk a, a little bit about that in a minute. Or you could do the pre-registration uh, uh, method. That is, you have a public and open registry of all studies where you have to register your study before you begin to collect data. And what does that bias? Well, uh, the people here at York PA and the people here at York uh, University, they intended to publish these studies. Uh, but what happened was when they uh, actually calculated their statistics, they discovered that it was non-significant, and so they knew they wouldn't get it published they probably didn't even try to publish it or maybe they tried and took it to a couple different journals and it was rejected at a couple different journals. So, uh, you know, because of that, for whatever reason, these studies, we don't know if they exist or not. But let's say that we go through a pre-registration process where everybody, when they start a study, before they start to collect data, they register it. And so now you have a public record of all the studies begun on this new test or all the studies done on uh, ego depletion. So let's take a look at what that means uh, coming back to the idea of ego depletion. Remember we're talking about self-control and here's what we want to see a meta-analysis because remember the uh, pyramid of scientific trustworthiness the meta-analysis is here on the top. And so Hager did a meta-analysis in 2010 on the ego depletion studies. They meta-analyzed 83 of them, and the results revealed a significant effect of ego depletion on self-control task performance. Woohoo! So yeah, uh, all the uh, you know talk about it, this is correct. Ego depletion really exists. You can wear out your willpower. However, look at this, uh, 2014, four years later, Carter and McAuliffe, uh, publication bias and the limited strength model of self-control. Has the evidence for ego depletion been overestimated? And so look what happens here. We applied methods for estimating and correcting for small study effects such as publication bias to the data, and once we did that, the, it indicated that the depletion effect is actually no different from zero. That is, there is no effect of ego depletion. And back in 2014, people in social psychology freaked out. This big thing that we thought we knew and were talking about and we were so proud of finding, now this is calling it into question about whether or not it exists or not. But remember, they said that they used methods for estimating uh, publication bias, for estimating the file drawer effect. That's not proof. And what we really want in science is proof. So just to review what went wrong, Hager in 2010, they didn't look at unpublished uh, studies, and they ran right into the file drawer problem. Uh, there, is a selective bias about the published studies. That is, only uh, significant studies that find a ego depletion effect 
are being reported. That's a bias. Carter et al. estimated the effect of the publication bias, but as I said, estimation is not proof. And if you pre-register studies, this would provide proof. What do I mean by that? Well, in pre-registration, what happens is that you design your study and you're getting ready to collect data, and then you pre-register it. And what that means is you go to a national headquarters and you go to their website and you upload your information. I'm Dr. Ashton and I'm going to do a study on ego depletion and here is my methodology and here is my predictions and here is the statistics I plan to use. And that's there forever now. And then I go and I collect my data and then I analyze my data and then there actually should there should be a, a branching here if things are significant then I publish my results but non-significant then I don't publish it goes into the file drawer however if somebody wanted to do a meta-analysis now they can go to the pre-registry and they say, hey, Ashton tried to do this study back in 2020, and here it is 2028, and I don't see anything published by Ashton. What's the deal? And so they can contact me, uh, and I can tell them, oh, yeah, I, I found nothing, so I just gave it up, put it in the file drawer. Uh, however, even if I had like gone to Alaska or the Antarctic or Mars, they still know that Ashton tried to do something on this back in 2020 and then just disappeared. So they have a pretty good idea that this is probably a file drawer effect. And so this is what we mean by how the pre-registration process can fight the publication bias or the file drawer effect. And uh, you know, as you can see here, 2018, Brian Nosick. Uh, the big uh, you know, head honcho in terms of pre-registration. He's saying pre-registration is becoming the norm in psychological science. I've never pre-registered a study, but I'm getting ready to do a study and I'm going to pre-register it for the first time because it's a new thing. And now look at this. Here we have a pre-registered study on ego depletion effect and it shows no evidence of ego depletion. And so that's what I'm talking about. Uh, now we can publish studies that show nothing that's non-significant because now we can you know, say that it's pre-registered. It's part of the whole process of finding out if there are negative studies that exist that uh, add negatively to the effects that we're seeing published. So the big conclusions, and this is the end of the lecture, uh, ego depletion. Uh, we seriously doubt, we have serious doubts about depletion in control theory of self-regulation. As a social psychologist, I would not give people advice about ego depletion. Uh, it just, we just don't know. At the, at the best, we don't know. At the worst, it doesn't exist. Uh, what about for social psychology? Well, this last decade has been the decade of the open science movement in psychology and it's to fight the file drawer effect and it's to fight other problems with research uh, and uh, so in uh, psychology and social psychology we're talking about pre-registering studies uh, publicly telling people I'm going to try to do this experiment and if it fails everybody's going to know it failed uh, you know that's why people didn't do this in the past because it's embarrassing but it's necessary for the uh, you know advancement of science also we're gonna have open data when I do finish the experiment I'm gonna upload all of my data so anybody can download it and reanalyze it and make sure I did it correctly but also they could take my data and put it into a big meta-analysis and then finally open materials uh, I can't tell you how many times I've run into the problem of not being able to find what questionnaire did you use here or uh, what uh, manipulation 
uh, did you use here? In your study, you said that, well, we just did this. How exactly did you do it? Because I've been trying to replicate it and I can't get, get it to work. So what exactly did you do? And, you know, you know, important studies from 20 years ago, I email one, uh, you know, author, oh, I don't remember, you know, email the other author. And I email the other author and say, oh my God, did you, did you talk to Chuck? Yeah, I just talked to Chuck. He said, email you. I can't remember. And so the open science movement is going to, uh, you know, really help uh, our ability to uh, weed out the file drawer effect and other negative things that are going on with how we practice science. And it's been kind of embarrassing, an embarrassing decade for social psychologists uh, because of this, uh, because of the open science framework and uh, you know, what we're finding out about some of the theories and findings that we hold dear. Uh, and so you could say it's embarrassing, uh, but then again, this is not just a social psychological science problem, but a psychological science problem and also it's a science problem in general. That is this open framework movement uh, is and should uh, go to other areas of psychology and should go to other areas of experimental science because they're having the same problem. So even though it's embarrassing for social psychologists to really look at this, we have to say that we're doing science in general a service by being very open and honest about some of the problems that all science has. So that, that's a good thing. All right, that's it for uh, today's lecture. Take care.